So my name is Guy Shavit, I'm with Signamax, uh, and today we're going to be doing an introduction to POE training. Uh, after the conclusion, uh, probably at some point next week, we will email uh, certifications to the registration email to those that participated. Uh, those of you that are uh, Bixie credential holders then can submit that certificate for uh, one uh, CEC or continuing education credit. Uh, so the agenda. Uh, what we will discuss today is, first of all, uh, some background about POE, terminology, abbreviations, use cases, etc. cetera. Uh, the second portion is going to be the POE standards, uh, the differences between them, the additions in the, the recent standards, uh, and so on. Uh, the next portion is going to be a detailed uh, POE procedure from the detection stage uh, all the way to uh, power removal. After that, we'll talk about power allocation, prioritization, and some non-standard uh, additional features that are uh, common in uh, POE equipment. And then we're going to have a, a Q&A portion. Uh, due to the number of attendees, I'll ask that you send questions via the chat. Uh, you can do that during the presentation. I can, if it's on the topic I'm discussing, I can answer immediately. Uh, if not, I'll answer in that last portion, uh, just because uh, uh, with, with this many people, we can't do it through audio. Okay. So, a little bit about the history of PUE. Uh, the history of PUE really starts with uh, voice over IP. Uh, voice over IP as a protocol uh, really was created in the mid to late 90s, 95, 96, uh, as a way for cheap international uh, and long distance calls. Uh, those of you old enough to remember how expensive it was uh, to do international calls at the time. Uh, after the protocol, the, the software uh, uh, came work devices that were dedicated devices, and initially they were really for the consumer market. Uh, but the work devices had a much uh, bigger advantage and, and reasons for use in the enterprise market. Uh, you know, think about a call center. Uh, type of uh, location, uh, but the big limitation was that they needed to be independently powered. And uh, when you think about POTS, the plain old telephone system uh, devices that were used previously, uh, they were powered uh, through the same uh, cabling infrastructure that provided the signal. Uh, and in order for, again, in our call center-like environment, in order to replace all the phones with a uh, voice over IP devices, uh, they would either need to run power uh, to all the locations uh, with all the, the cost and the complexity and, and just, uh, you know, uh, uh, chaos, if you will, uh, with that many uh, cabling devices and, and wiring, or... Uh, the devices themselves would need to be powered through the same cable that the signal is coming through, similar to, to phone systems. So uh, initially, uh, PoE was a proprietary uh, technology. It was developed uh, by the company. Let's put it this way, a major company uh, that had and created and was trying to market the voice over IP uh, handsets to the enterprise market. Uh, and very quickly, there were multiple uh, different companies with uh, slightly different uh, implementations of uh, power uh, over a, uh, the standard uh, communication cable. And then uh, until the standards that we will discuss a little bit later came, right? So PoE, uh, as, as the term uh, states, is a technology to transfer power over the standard communication cable uh, concurrent with the Ethernet data flow. Again, initially it was created for voice over IP. Later on, uh, as IP video devices uh, in the early 2000s uh, were conceived, uh, it, they were used for that. Uh, without PoE, there probably would not have been uh, the IP video cameras, or if there were IP video cameras, they would not have had uh, the wide deployment that they currently enjoy. Uh, in regards to terminology, uh, 
the PoE basically has uh, two sides to it. There's the powered device, uh, which is referred to as PD, which would be the voice handset or the IP video camera. And then there's the power sourcing equipment, the PSE, uh, which there are two uh, types of power sourcing equipment. It could either be uh, the uh, device that is providing also the, the switching capability for the data, uh, aka a PoE switch, or it could be a device that is uh, added in between the switch and uh, just injects the data into the cable, uh, and those are called either mid-spans or uh, when they're for individual ports, uh, we use the term PoE injectors. Uh, you will see that the terminology endpoint and mid-span, uh, which are these two different types of PSEs, are in some cases due to legacy reasons uh, misused also for the, the power modes. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, Okay, so this diagram is really just uh, for to go over the terminology. Uh, we see that we have a we have a switch that is not providing PoE. We have a switch that is providing PoE. The PoE switch is a PSE, and the type of PSE would be would be an endpoint. We have a PoE injector that's a mid-span PSE, and then we have access points, voice over IP phone, IP camera. Those are all PDs or power devices. Uh, other devices in the network that are not participating in the PoE uh, in any shape and form, like this uh, switch or the computers or the, the mobile handsets, uh, just have no terminology in, in the PoE world. They're not consistent. Now, why use PoE? I mean, I think that the advantages of PoE uh, are relatively clear, mostly revolve around the the, the, the fact that there's no need for separate power input, right? Uh, that saves money on the infrastructure. It makes it a, a cleaner install. Uh, it allows more flexibility in the device placement uh, because, you know, we're all familiar with uh, PoE devices that are uh, very remote or placed in difficult-to-reach locations. Uh, if there was no PoE, we would have to run 110 volt AC power to that location. Uh, that would, you know, be expensive. It might be dangerous in some cases, or, or require a more elaborate safety mechanisms. Uh, and of course, if you then want to move the device, uh, you got to move the power source too, right? With uh, PoE, it's it's a lot easier uh, to uh, move the, the the Ethernet cable. Uh, don't need a licensed electrician for that. Uh, there are a few additional advantages that are not specifically related to that savings in AC power. Uh, one is that you can remotely control the devices from a power standpoint. So uh, you can shut down or reset the devices remotely, uh, which would not be able to do if they were independently powered. Uh, it also makes it much easier uh, to do any kind of power redundancy. Uh, since all the power is provided at a central head end, uh, you can provide it a UPS or have uh, dual uh, redundant power inputs uh, and so forth, which, which is, would be a lot harder if uh, the, the power was, was locally administered to you know, tens, hundreds, or thousands of devices. Uh, another advantage of PoE over uh, not over regular AC power, but over in, in general, is that uh, as we'll go through the procedure, we'll see that there's a whole lot of automation involved. So uh, there's a little configuration or management that is required to make PoE work. Okay, so a little bit about the standards, right? Uh, the original uh, PoE standard uh, was uh, approved by IEEE in 2003. It was called 8023AF. Uh, as I mentioned before, there were uh, there was PoE pre the standard, and the companies that created the original PoE technology, uh, both for the PSEs and the PDs, are the same companies that are on the standard committee creating the standard. And that influences the standard uh, quite a bit, as we'll, uh, we'll see as we talk and go through it. 
original standard supported delivery of uh, up to 15.4 watts. Uh, you'll see all the standards, there's always two numbers, right? There's what the PSC needs to be able to provide and what the PD uh, is the maximum that it can expect to receive. In this case, it was 15.4 at the PSE, 12.95 watts at the PD. And the reason for that is that there is loss on the line. And the standard has to assume worst case scenario. In the case of 802.3AS, uh, it's supported from category three cable and above. So it had to assume a category three cable and up to 100 meters or the 328 feet that is specified in Ethernet standards. Uh, so the loss over the worst category three cable over 100 meters, uh, and, and that's what you end up with. Most cases will be better than that, but the PD cannot ever assume any standards to spec power device, cannot assume that it can get more than 12.95 watts, right? Otherwise, uh, it, it will just not adhere to the standard. Uh, lots of beeping here. Uh, and then the second standard right, from 2009 was 802.3 AT. Uh, it was uh, sometimes referred to a PoE plus. Uh, at this point is when we have IP video cameras and, and devices that uh, need more than 15 watts, um, maybe video conferencing phones uh, as well, but most phones, uh, uh, did not require a lot of power, but once you started talking about cameras that might have a pan and zoom, uh, might have multiple sensors and so forth, uh, they need a little bit more power. So 802.3AT comes out in 2009, provides up to 30 watts. Again, at the PSE, the PD can expect to receive up to 25.5 watts. Uh, and it introduces the concept of type. So type one refers to uh, all devices that confirm to the original 8023AF specification, whereas type two are devices that uh, confirm to the newer 8023AT specification. Uh, PoE plus or 8023AT is fully backward compatible. Uh, so uh, it can work in both directions. You could have any 8023AF and PD and device will work with any 802.3AT PSE device. Uh, and in the other direction, if the PSE is 802.3AF, then an 802.3AT PD will work, but the one limitation is it can only expect to receive a type one uh, up to 15.4 watts of power, right? So they, the whole, the whole uh, POE procedure we'll talk about in a little bit uh, involves the negotiation uh, in which the compatibility is in both directions, but you can't expect the power sourcing equipment to provide more power than the spec that it adheres to, right? In 2018, uh, PO 8023BT was approved. Uh, sometimes this is referred to as PoE++. Uh, I've seen high PoE uh, being used. Uh, it is not UPoE. UPoE was a proprietary uh, protocol uh, by Cisco, uh, it, it provides input into 8023BT, but it's a separate uh, technology. There are differences between them. Uh, so sometimes you, at the beginning when 8023BT pre-spec was coming out, you would see some devices that would use the term UPOE, but that is uh, incorrect, and I don't really see that as much anymore. Uh, 8023BT introduced two new additional types, uh, type three and four. Type three is basically an upgrade for the existing standard. It doubles the amount of power for the, the, the that is being provided by the PSE by using uh, all four pairs. Uh, we'll see a little bit later, the traditional original PoE standards only used two pairs uh, of wires for providing power. Uh, 802.3BT introduces the ability to use four pairs and that allows it to, to double the power. Uh, one big major additional change that was done in 8023BT is shortening of the MPS. The MPS is how much power the PD needs to draw, uh, basically when it's in standby mode, when it doesn't need any power. Uh, if it drops below that, then it's 
the, the PFC is going to cut it off. It's going to disconnect it uh, for safety reasons. Uh, and and we'll, when we go through the whole procedure, we'll, we'll see how that works. Uh, so the MPS was reduced uh, actually quite significantly. Uh, this is very important for devices that are in standby mode uh, quite frequently or, or for a large percentage of the time, for example, POE lighting uh, or all kinds of newer generation Internet of Things kind of devices that might not be always on like a camera is. Uh, and it's uh, where, where the, the power requirements is, uh, is significant and important. Now, type four not only uh, has the, the four pair uh, usage, uh, but also there were a few other uh, changes that were made in order to be able to provide even higher power. Uh, one of the changes is the use of uh, higher minimum voltage. Uh, we have a little table in a minute that it compares all of these, but for using higher voltage, uh, you can provide uh, at the same current level, uh, more power or wattage at the end. Uh, the, the current streaming through the, the, the wire is what is going to influence uh, the, the loss and, and heat uh, and so forth. So uh, that, is, that is the difference that was done there. Type 4 also has additional limitations uh, for safety reasons. Uh, I think it's being mentioned here, uh, for example, uh, this is just one example that is a type 4 limitation. Uh, they cannot exceed certain wattage for more than a certain amount of time, four seconds in this case, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, the 802.3BT certification is similarly to 802.3AT backwards compatible. Uh, again, that means that if I have an 802.3BT PSC, then any 802.3AF or 802.3AT PD it's fully compatible. It can connect, negotiate, receive the power it needs, and so forth. If I have an 802.3BT PD, it can also connect to an 802.3AF or 802.3AT PSE uh, with full compatibility. But, of course, it can only expect to receive the power up to the limit of, of what the PSE is uh, capable of or, or what it adheres to. Okay. So these are the four types that we mentioned. Type 1 is the original 802.3AF devices. Type 2 is 802.3AT, the 2009 standard devices. And then type 3 and 4 are from 802.3BT, and we can see the different power limitations uh, or uh, maximum power uh, available at both the PD and the PSC. You also notice there's uh, the voltage range, uh, and, and that a, has increased over time for the reasons I mentioned earlier. But the PD will always have a broader range than PSC, specifically on the, the low end. And the reason is when you have a loss over the, the cable, uh, you will also have a voltage drop. Uh, so if the PSC is providing, let's say, in the first standard, at 44 volts after 100 meters, depending on the gauge of the, the, the wire, uh, it might be 40 volts or 41 volts and so on. So a PD that is to spec needs to be able to properly operate at the full range of voltages uh, that, that is mentioned here. I have seen issues and sometimes with PD devices uh, that either overheat or give alarms and, and alerts that the, the voltage is not high enough and so on. But Again, if, if it adheres to the spec, it needs to be able to fully operate at this full range. Another uh, uh, term that is in the standards that we've not mentioned so far is class. The original 8023AF standard defined three classes uh, and then a default. And uh, the class was basically the, a the way that they, the people that wrote the standards were thinking from a power allocation standpoint. Uh, the three classes that were in the original standard were different power levels that the PD would basically, by saying that it is a, a class one or a class three, it's saying how much power it needs within a range. Uh, and then the PSE uh, would be able to allocate power accordingly. In 802.3 AT, one of the, of the uh, 
uh, updates that were were made was that apart from the, uh, the adding a fourth class, uh, they also added the abilities of the PD and the PSC to negotiate, uh, or the PD to mention how much power it needs uh, using LLDP uh, up to a, a 0.1 watt uh, kind of accuracy. So it provided a much better uh, ability, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, uh, to specify exactly how much power the PD needs. Uh, Type A3 added two more classes, so there's six in total, and Type 4 added two more additional ones. Uh, again, the classes are used uh, as a way for the PD to mention, to say how much, specify how much power it needs, but there are better ways to do that, specifically with LDP. Uh, the original Type 1, A2, 3, AES, uh, was supported from a Category 3 or better. Uh, all the newer standards are Category 5 or better. Uh, and uh, these modes. The modes are uh, the legacy uh, kind of requirement that I mentioned earlier because of the, the pre-standard uh, uh, protocols that were being used uh, by different vendors. Uh, originally, PoE only required two pairs uh, out of the four pairs that are going to be in a Category 5 or above cable. Uh, and one of the companies uh, used what's referred to as the data pair. The other company used the alternative pair, the non-spare pair. Uh, and then when they, those same two companies were, uh, for the most part, uh, the primary uh, writers of the spec, they already had equipment out there that used, you know, they had made shifts that used one or the other. And uh, what they did in the original standard was they specified that the PSE can use either. The PD is required to support both. Uh, before the standards, there were uh, compatibility issues. If you got a PSE from one vendor and a PD from another, they might not work because they would be uh, using uh, you know, the different uh, cables. One of the things they put in the standard to standardize it is that PD is required to support both mode A and mode B. You also notice that I wrote there in supported modes endpoint, flat, and midspan. Uh, the truth of the matter is, if you remember, an endpoint is when the switch is also the PSE. An endpoint can be either mode A or mode B. Uh, a midspan can be mode A or mode B. That terminology is incorrectly used sometimes uh, because of the, the two major companies that were involved at the time, that one of them created endpoints, the other one created its fans, and one of them used that mode A and the other one mode B. But in theory now, a, any PSE can be either mode A or mode B. And you see that in 8023BT, we introduced a four-pair mode, in which case that becomes uh, uh, irrelevant. Uh, Type 3, 8023BT, because of its backward compatibility, uh, will support still both two-pair and four-pair. Uh, type 4 is, is purely four-pair. Now, someone asked me here on the chat uh, about type 3 and 4. Uh, I'm not 100% sure I understand a, the question, but 8023BT, the new standard that came out two years ago, added two types a type 3 and a type 4. Both of them were added under this standard. They have uh, different limitations uh, and different requirements. Uh, and hence, there's two different, and you can see the compatibility is different. So a, you know, a new PSC that is fully 8023BT compliant, like one of our uh, C600 series switches, will support maybe both type 3 and type 4. Uh, and then you might have a device that is a type 3 device or a device that is a type 4 device, and then they, they have to, the standards uh, requires different, uh, they, they, the, the way they work, the minimum voltage and so on would be different. Okay, so here are the classes uh, that we just discussed. Uh, again, these were historically uh, really important, and that's why you see that there are, there are more of them in the original standard, 8023AEF, uh, because it was the primary way to for the PD to say how much power it needs, right? Uh, we get a little bit afterwards the power allocation. It's very important. Uh, if you have a PSE, let's say a 24-port switch, uh, very commonly it is not going to have the power supply 
uh, be able to, to provide, let's say if we were talking about the original uh, standard, provide uh, 15.4 watts uh, for all ports concurrently. So if it does not have a sufficient power supply for that, someone uh, connects, it needs to know how much power do I need to allocate for this port. Uh, it can by default, and it will have to by default, uh, allocate the full 15.4 watts if it doesn't know better. But if the PV tells it, oh, I'm just a type two, I only need seven watts, well, that's better than it can allocate just seven watts there and, and know and be safe with that knowledge, right? Uh, as I mentioned, nowadays, LDP allows us a much finer allocation method, and, and we'll go through allocation a little bit uh, later. Okay, so we're at the POE procedure uh, portion here, and we're going to start with detection. Uh, now, the first question I'd ask is why, right? Why do I need to do detection? And the, the reason is that if I was providing, uh, PSC was providing 48 volts power without detecting that I have a PD connected at the end, and someone connects a device that is not a POE device, let's say a laptop uh, or another switch or something like that, uh, you could very well uh, fry the electronics because they, they just do not have the resistors there that are expecting to get 48 volts, right? And that's why uh, what the POE specification uh, does is includes a quote-unquote handshake, which is what we'll talk about here, and it only provides power if there is a valid PD that is detected at the other end of the cable. Uh, and not only that, it needs to, as we talk about it further, it needs to remove power whenever that PD is, is taken away. So uh, first thing it does is the detection. How does it do detection? So you have to, when I talk about things like a handshake or talking to each other, detect, you can only talk to someone if the other side is talking back and the PD needs the POE power in order to be able to function, right? So the way it works is that the PSC is providing a low voltage power on the wires. And in case of a fourth pair, it has to do it on both pairs. Uh, otherwise, it will do it just on the, the pair that it, it uh, uses. And the TD has to have a resistor there that is got a very specific resistance, which is the 25K ohm that you see here. And then if the PSE detects that, then it knows that there's a valid PD there and it can move on to the next stage. Uh, it looks a little bit like this, right? During the detection stage, the PSE is providing uh, some voltage on the wire, but it's a low voltage that is not going to damage uh, any uh, non-PoE devices there. Uh, and then when it detects, if it detects that there is a PD there via the resistance, uh, then it will move on to the next stage, uh, which is the classification. Now, not only that, the PSC also has to continually check the presence of the PD on the port at regular intervals. And we're going to see a little bit later how it does that through the, the MPS uh, that I mentioned, the minimum power. Uh, and, but the, the moment or the microsecond, millisecond that the PSE detects that the PD is no longer there, it has to remove the power. This is to avoid a situation where, you know, I connect the camera to the port, it does the whole PoE detection classification, starts providing power, then I disconnect the power and connect my laptop, and the PSC continues providing 48 volts and fries it, right? Uh, you want to avoid that the moment that uh, the PSC detects that the PD is no longer there. It needs to stop providing power, uh, which means that, again, if I have a camera connected to providing power, I disconnect it, connect it back again, it will have to start the whole process from the beginning. Now, in 8023BT, we introduced another step before the classification that is called connection check. Uh, and this is uh, relevant only for four pair capable devices. Uh, basically, it's a check to see if the PD wants to have uh, what's called a single signature or a dual signature. Uh, a single signature 
means that there is uh, one uh, basically PD at the end. Uh, that's going to be one of the classes that we mentioned up to the 90 watts and so forth. A dual signature means that even though there's one device at the end, it is behaving from a PoE standpoint as two separate devices. We're going to have two independent loads, their own electronic uh, electric uh, circuitry. Uh, and, uh, you know, an example for this is a surveillance camera that has, uh, you know, one uh, device would be the camera, the other device would be like a heater or a blower or something. Uh, and instead of them being connected uh, from an electrical standpoint as they were in previous standards, uh, this allows them to be two separate circuits. Uh, again, the PD might decide that this makes, or the manufacturer of the PD might decide that it makes sense to do it this way, uh, either because it simplifies the, you know, the electronics and, and can be a, a lower cost, or it allows it some modularity or, or allows it compatibility of, you know, using uh, uh, different components that can be replaced internally. Uh, but the PSC needs to now check um, if this is a single signature PD or a dual signature PD. I'll mention, this is in the standard. The PSEs needs, PSEs needs to support it. Uh, I'm not familiar with PDs yet that use it. Uh, maybe there are the ones now. Again, you have to remember this is all new. A lot of times things are put in standard and are never actually implemented for market reasons. Uh, this one, I, I don't know if it's going to you know, catch on because it, it really depends uh, on the... Uh, you know, what kind of cost savings the PD vendors see from it. Uh, but there, it's just a new process, a, a new step in the procedure. The next step that everybody uh, has is a classification. Uh, classification is uh, provided in, uh, say, PSC is providing a, a voltage, it's a higher voltage than we saw during the detection stage, but still not the maximum voltage. And, and now it's providing a current as well on the port. Uh, if the PD supports whatever classification, and you'll see this goes in uh, waves, uh, it's like a yes, no question. The PSC is asking, do you support classes one and two, let's say, and then the PD uh, will respond yes, then it will move on and, and check if it supports uh, the higher classes and so forth. Uh, Eventually, what we, what we find through this negotiation process is the PSC finds out what classes the PD uh, supports and hence uh, how, much, uh, how much power it's, it's asking for. So if we look at the diagram here, there are going to be up to five of these, uh, sometimes referred to as humps, uh, in which uh, the PD a, is basically saying if it supports uh, a, this group of classes or not, up to uh, the you know class eight, which would be the type four fully ninety watts. Okay, once the PD detects a sorry, once the PSC detects the power class of the PD, now it can decide. Okay, this is how much power the PD is asking for. Do I have that in my budget? Uh, if it does. Uh, then it will allocate that and uh, go into the next step here in the procedure. If it does not, uh, then uh, we'll discuss a little bit later, but there's two options. Either it just stops the, the PoE process and does not provide power to that device, or it kicks off a different device in order to provide power to this device if it's a higher priority uh, device. The next step in the PoE procedure is called inrush. Uh, this basically means that instead of providing the full uh, power immediately, there is a gradual increase uh, of the current to the PD. It's going to take between 50 and 75 uh, milliseconds, depending on the class. Uh, again, this is a very short amount of time, but the only relevance for this is it's just that when you're starting up PoE device to have to go through all of these uh, steps in, before you can have uh, full power and really the device can start up. Uh, so if, again, if we're looking at our diagram, that is this stage here. And the next stage is powering. Uh, most PoE devices are going to spend the vast majority of their time in the powering stage. That's normal operations. 
right? Uh, and during this, uh, during this period or this stage, the PSC, they constantly have to check for abnormal conditions. Uh, if it's short circuit or an overload, if the PD is trying to draw more power than it is allowed to by the class, all of those will cause it to disconnect the power. Uh, and there is the MPS that we mentioned before, the minimum power signature. So what is this? Uh, for classes one to four, uh, the minimum uh, a power signature was that the device had to draw at least 10 milliamps for 75 milliseconds with a maximum of 250 milliseconds uh, of, of off time. So meaning every 325 milliseconds, at least 75 milliseconds straight had needed 10 milliamps to be drawn. And at 48 volts, that means a basically a standby consumption of 210 milliwatts. Uh, why is this, what does all this mean? If we got a, a camera and it's working, it's gonna be drawing more than 10 uh, milli, well, it will probably be drawing more than 10 milliamps all the time. Uh, or at least it's, it's drawing that at least some time it's not an issue. If you have a device like let's say a VoIP phone where I'm not on a call, maybe it doesn't need that much power. I have a POE lighting device. The light's turned off. It's definitely not needing any power, right? But every 250 milliseconds, it has to basically start drawing at least that 10 milliamps for 75 milliseconds. Otherwise, the switch is going to, or the PSE is going to disconnect it. In the newer classes, in the 8023BT classes, that was lowered, as I mentioned before, to uh, 16 milliamps, but only for 7 milliseconds, then with 10, 310 milliseconds of off time. So the overall consumption in standby mode is a tenth of what was before. It drops from 210 milliwatts to 20 milliwatts. And again, the reason is, we are seeing and expecting more devices that are going to be uh, spend more of their time in standby mode. Uh, again, POE lighting being an example, maybe some digital signage, things like that that are not always actually have to be on kiosks. Uh, and uh, and this older MPS was a little bit inefficient in electricity usage. Uh, we mentioned before mode A, mode B. Uh, in the traditional 8023AF and AT, only two pairs need to be used, uh, either the data pair or the spare pair. Uh, the different vendors I mentioned before uh, implemented it differently, but the PDs now that are anything that is to spec needs to accept those power options. Uh, the specification is going to state exactly what voltage range the PSC must apply and what the PD must support. The PSC is supplying you know, power voltage lower than that, it, it's not up to spec. Similarly, if the PD is not able to function at anything in that range, it's not up to spec. In the PD, there is, I'm, I'm going to say always, but let's say almost always going to be a DC to DC converter that, that steps down that 48 volt to lower voltage that's suitable for the electronics. Uh, you could ask if all the electronic devices need much lower voltage than 48 volt. Uh, why, are we, why is POE at 48 volts? Uh, and the reason is the same reason that you have, you know, high voltage power lines between cities, right? The lower voltage that we use, uh, the higher work the current's going to have to be to provide the same power to the device, which means you're going to have more loss. Uh, so why not higher than 48 volts? Well, you get a little bit higher than that and you're no longer a low voltage device and you're up to all kinds of regulatory and safety issues uh, that we don't want to get into. So we're going 48 to 57 volts. That is the limit of how high we can go while still remaining a low voltage device uh, and having minimizing the, the loss that we get over, over the wire. Uh, that means that PDs are going to end up stepping it down uh, you know, most uh, boards are going to use 9 volts, 5 volts, 3.3 volts, and nothing really higher than that. At most, maybe 12. Uh, if there's a motor there, you know, like a pan camera or something, maybe it needs a, maybe up to 24 volts. But even that is, is usually going to be stepped down. Uh, 
they, apart from which pair is used, there is also the question of which they, with the polarity, which side is the, the, the positive and the negative of the electric current. Uh, again, in any device that is, any PD that is to spec uh, will have to support uh, both all modes that are within that spec. So there's no compatibility issues nowadays. Uh, these were compatibility issues pre-spec. I have seen some devices that support, that claim to support in their data sheet, you know, 8023AF, but actually don't. They, they will only work in, you know, one of the modes, and even then will only work if the positive or negative is in one direction, but that is not uh, proper devices. They, they're, they're, not, they're not up to the spec. The last process, uh, last stage in the process is uh, power removal. Uh, remember, the PSC constantly needs to be monitoring the PD. Uh, it's checking uh, to the MPS. It's checking that it has, you know, that right uh, resistance. Uh, and if there is no longer a PD connected, it will disconnect the power. It will also disconnect the power if there's a short circuit or the PD draws excess power and overload and so on. Okay, now I wanted to spend a minute here to talk about uh, something that is not part of the PoE standard and it's actually not quote unquote PoE, which is uh, passive PoE. Uh, passive PoE is non-standard, uh, which means that there is no, you know, there is no standard specification of how it works uh, and all these, uh, you know, uh, kind of handshakes and so on that we discussed. Uh, it doesn't perform the detection, so the power there is always on, which means that if you do connect a device that is not uh, expecting to get power there, you will cause damage. Uh, it also means that if you connect a device that is a standard PoE device to it, it might work or might not work, depending on if the device is uh, expecting and, and willing to accept power without the, the classification uh, portion done at the beginning or not. It also means that if you're taking a passive PoE uh, PSE from one vendor and a PD from another vendor, it might work or not work depending on their implementation, right? Uh, all this that I talked about as far as which pair is being used and which one, the polarity and so on, there is no standard here. So uh, this is purely proprietary, might work, might not work, totally up to uh, a random, I don't say random, but, but the question is if they're, they're using the same uh, pairs in the same direction. And also, since there's no standard, you, you will get products that are 24 volts, 48 volts, I've seen 56 volts. Uh, again, uh, not... Uh, the, there is no, no standard, no compatibility uh, that is guaranteed here. Okay, back to standard PoE. Uh, I mentioned a few times power location, why and, and, and what. Uh, as I mentioned, it is common to have PSEs be oversubscribed, uh, meaning that, a, I don't know, it's a 24 volt a, a port, it supports 8023AT, so 30 watts, on every port, but it does not have an actual power supply that is able to provide that because it knows that most of the devices do not need that much and so on. But when a device is connected and I do the whole dedication and a detection, I'm sorry, and classification, unless the device tells me I only need seven watts, I have to assume that it needs, you know, whatever class, the, the top end of whatever class it's specified and the reason is that it might be using only, you know, 10 watts right now, but in a second, maybe all of a sudden it starts to pan or a heater turns on or something and it needs 30 watts. I have to have that power ready for it. I can't uh, be in a situation for the standard uh, where uh, once it needs that power, it, it's, not, it's not available to it. So this is where allocation comes in. And there's, there's three methods for, for allocation. Uh, the first one, as I mentioned, which was what was in the original standard, is class. And we saw that those class ranges were quite uh, large in some cases. So between 7 and 15 watts, it, it wasn't more granular than that. Uh, that caused some problems in the market as far as 
we had a lot of devices. It was also not mandatory at the time. So a lot of devices, a lot of the PD devices did not support the classification. And so the default said that it has to, you know, have to be up to 15.4. Uh, and then you get an H port switch, only has 60 watts of power. And if every device that connects to it is a, it has to allocate 15.4, um, only going to be able to connect four devices to it. So a lot of the vendors of the PSCs uh, added an option there to basically user specify the limitation. So if you know that the device you're connecting there only needs seven watts, even though it's not doing that in the handshake, go ahead, write seven watts, and then you'd be able to go, you know, move ahead and connect all eight devices to it. It's not ideal, obviously, to be user error. It has to actually require configuration, which we said uh, is uh, not something we want too much in PoE. Uh, 802.3.8t added the LODP method. Uh, not all PD devices support it, but the ones that do, they can publish via LODP exactly how much power they need. They're still going to publish the max power that they need, uh, not the, you know, the current, and it, and, uh, and it might depend on what the configuration of that PD is, uh, but it at least uh, provides us a much better granularity for the PSC to allocate accordingly. Uh, I have a question that someone asked me here about uh, what manufacturers have passive PoE products. Uh, so it, it, it's not hidden or anything like that. They, they want, they, when it's passive PoE, you should not be confused. It says passive PoE, but uh, a large uh, vendor that uses a lot of passive PoE is, uh, for example, Ubiquity. Uh, again, not saying anything positive or negative about it, but they have a devices and devices that are powered by passive PoE, and then they also have the sourcing uh, that provides it. And then in that case, again, you're using their products on both ends, then you're not going to have compatibility issues I talked about before, right? But you do have to be very careful that if you're getting a either passive PoE injector or a switch with passive PoE, that you don't connect anything to it uh, that is not expecting a 48 volts uh, uh, power added, or, or you will, and, and I've seen many cases of that where they, they fry devices. Okay, going back to where we were before. So power allocation, what happens if I don't have enough power, right? So I mentioned before, I got an A4 switch, uh, but I only have I think, 65 watts of a PoE budget. I got first device connect, asked to allocate 15 watts, second one needs 30 watts, Okay, I, third one is asking now for 30 watts. I don't have enough power for it. That's where the port prioritization comes in. Uh, Manage switches allow you to configure uh, there's various methods, either two prioritizations or in our case, many three. Uh, you could pr a, configure what is the most critical code ports for you that are gonna receive power quote unquote first, we get allocated uh, and Anything beyond that will not be. Uh, unmanaged switches and default managed switches uh, that don't have any prioritization configured. Every single switch I've ever encountered just goes by port number. Uh, so port number one is always, always going to get power first, then port number two and then three and so on. Uh, so if you want to prioritize it that way, you can. Uh, there's two times that I can think of that port prioritization comes into play. Uh, one is when you're actually connecting devices, right? So, you know, you have four devices connected, now you connected a fifth device, you know, that's, that's when allocation and prioritization matters uh, or when it's coming up, right? When they, the switch is rebooting, uh, that's what, when it matters. During normal operation, uh, nothing's gonna change there. Apart from, if you have a switch or a PSC that has uh, two power supplies for redundancy's sake, uh, or not redundancy, but uh, both of them are providing power, and one of them fails. So now you're down to one power supply, the switch still functions, but its PoE budget is cut, uh, and then the prioritization is gonna, gonna come into play. So even if in that kind of environment, you have enough power that prioritization should not be an issue, it could be an issue if one of the power supplies fails. You've got to switch with two power supplies for redundancy uh, purpose, but 
does it have enough power with a single power supply for all the devices, or do you need to prioritize? Another feature that is not the standard, but is becoming more and more common on, on many devices is a POE keep alive or auto check. Implementation varies, uh, but basically uh, what would happen in this case is you configure uh, IP addresses of the end devices, to the switch or the PSC, and it will check via ping if the device is alive. Uh, again, the implementation might be if it misses a certain amount of pings in a certain amount of time, then I'm assuming that there's an issue there and I'm going to reset the device. Or instead of reset, you could, you could have a different, uh, you know, just send an alert. This feature was developed very specifically because of IP security cameras that would, would freeze and get stuck and, and, you know, they, a administrator would manually go into the switch and power down, power up and, uh, then they asked us as the vendors, uh, can we do this automatically, please? And, you know, that gets implemented as, as a feature. Uh, it's not in the, any of the specs, but it is, it is a common uh, feature. And I have got six minutes before uh, uh, I take up the entire hour. Uh, so timing's not bad. Uh, if anybody has additional questions, uh, they can put them in in the chat. Uh, and I'll try to answer them. Uh, if not, uh, in the meantime, thank you for joining the training. Uh, I hope you found it educational. Uh, if you do have any questions you think about later or you're interested in learning about, you know, any Sigmax POE products, feel free to reach out to us in here. Uh, you can reach out to our tech support or any of our salespeople, of course, uh, via phone or via email. Uh, and then, of course, we will be sending out next week the certificates to all the registered email addresses that participated, uh, a, and it should be next week. Now, let's see. I've got a question here from Colin. Does anyone make a POE to USB PD in-wall unit? Uh, so if I understand correctly, what you're asking for is if anyone makes a in-wall unit that is powered by PoE and then provides uh, USB power to the end devices. Uh, I don't know if you're asking about communication as well. Uh, I, I don't know. That's something you can look into. Not something we have because uh, we don't do in-wall in units. Uh, there's no reason you wouldn't be able to do that. What they exist very commonly here, things purely to, to power and not communication. Uh, PoE splitters that I didn't mention here are the opposite of injectors. Uh, they are going to be a PD. They uh, do the whole handshake with the PSC and so on, and then split the, the power uh, out of the, the data communication. So what you come out with is a RJ45, uh, you know, port that is purely data, and then a uh, DC. Uh, usually steps down to 12 or 9 volts or something like that, uh, power cord uh, that can be used for, you know, devices that are not PD devices, right? Uh, and then I got another question here. I'm sorry that going through this chat, I have to scroll up. Uh, Tim is asking if there's a maximum number of powered switches that can be on a single network. So when you say power, they... You can have, when you talk about switches, uh, assuming you're talking about PSE, uh, PSEs, power sourcing equipment, uh, there's no maximum number that can be on a network. Again, each switch, or PSE in this case, is connected uh, to power source itself. It's got a power supply, and then it's providing power over its, you know, RJ45 uh, links to PD devices, they're totally independent of each other. Now, if you're asking if I connect two PSCs, two switches to each other, uh, what would happen uh, in that case, again, because we have the detection stage, uh, neither one of them is going to detect the other as a PD, and hence they're not going to provide uh, power there. Uh, so, so there's no, no issue there. Uh, and if that does not answer your question, uh, what I suggest is uh, you can 
you know, send me a, a more detailed email with the, the question and the, the email that's, that's on the, the screen right now because uh, I'm not sure that through the chat uh, uh, and then with me talking, but not hearing you, it's uh, getting through. Any other questions? No, if not, that's our hour. Thank you very much. Everybody have a good day and uh, enjoy your weekend.